Good afternoon. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Sonia Hernandez, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So I'd like, on behalf of our office, I would like to welcome you here today. I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker. Jordan Marie brings three white horses. Daniel is a citizen of the Kul Wichasha Oyate um, tribe, which is part of the lower Brule Sioux tribe, as well as a passionate and devoted advocate for the Indian country. Nationally, she's known for her advocacy and grassroots organizations for anti-pipeline, climate change justice efforts, change the name, not your mascot, the epidemic and crisis of MMIWG and Native Youth Initiatives. Her experience in grants management, policy, blogging, and organizing has been leveraged by both nonprofit and for-profit organizations in the areas of environmental sustainability, access to quality health care, missing and murdered indigenous women, the Violence Against Women's Act, and a variety of other worthy causes. Jordan is the founder and organizer of the Rising Hearts Coalition, an indigenous-led group designed to elevate awareness of indigenous issues and uplifting indigenous voices and efforts, while building collaborative partnerships to accomplish equitable and just treatment of all people and the earth we depend on through targeted organizing and advocacy. She is also the co-founder of DC Reinvest Coalition, a group focused on getting Washington DC to divest its funds from the Wells Fargo and defund fossil fuels and look toward public banking to reinvest in the local community. Jordan sits on, on the boards of directors with Native Hope, Power Shift Network, and Lab 29, and was recently named as a 2018 recipient of the NCAIED Native American 40 Under 40 Award. Currently, she is using her running platform of 21 years to help raise awareness of missing and murdered indigenous relatives by dedicating miles that she runs to a missing or murdered indigenous person. Hashtag running for justice. She is among many indigenous people working to elevate th this crisis and to bring justice to the families and victims. Jordan is an outreach and project manager with the UCLA helping researchers with their project proposals and continuing to organize in the community she lives in, which is Los Angeles, indigenous lands to the Tongva people. Ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Marie brings three white horses, Daniel. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, is the mic? Do I need to? There we go. Hi. I'm a Takiapi, Chante Washte Anape, Chiyuzapi, Jordan, Daniel, and Machiapi. Uh, my relatives, I greet you with a warm heart, heartfelt handshake. Uh, Jordan Daniel is what they call me. Um, as she said, I am a citizen of Kuichasha Oyate, the Lower Brule Indian Reservation. Um, in central South Dakota. Um, first things first, I want to give respect, acknowledge um, to the traditional lands that we are occupying, which are homelands to the Ottawa, Chippewa, and Potawatomi indigenous peoples. And so let's just give an appreciation and an uplift to the lands that we're residing on. So again, I'm really appreciative to, to the folks that have brought me here today to speak before you to hopefully give you some insight into what it's like being an indigenous person, how you can make change for yourself when it's something that you truly believe in and, and fighting for, um, and hopefully just inspire you. And just also hoping to correct the narrative of how people see native people today. Um, so a little bit about myself, I was born in South Dakota and was there for nine years and was surrounded by my community and that was home to me and it still is home. That's where my roots are, that's where my people are. Then I moved to Maine to a very rural place where I was the only person of color for a long time. And at that moment, at nine years old, I felt like I was walking in two worlds. Two worlds of being a Lakota woman but also living in a society that was 
very civilized, you had to assimilate, very white dominant, um, a town that had no idea that they had five federally recognized tribes in their state. And it was a real struggle for me. It, it made me question my identity of who I was as a person. I dealt with racism for the first time, was called horrible words that I didn't even know existed until my parents told me what they meant. And that was when I knew I was different, but I didn't want to be. And at first, I was ashamed to be who I was, to be brown, to be a Native person for a long time. And it wasn't until college that I started taking Native American Studies courses. I started volunteering with Penobscot Indian Nation and started to really dive back into my culture and who I was and the people that I come from, which my ancestors sacrificed long ago for us to be here and exist today and to thrive and to be resilient and to carry on our culture moving forward. And it was in that moment in those classes that I decided I am who I am. I'm proud to be brown. I'm proud to be Lakota. And this is who I'm meant to be. And I was born this way for a reason. Knowing in eighth grade, I knew I wanted to be an advocate for Indian country. Seeing firsthand in, in my tribe, the healthcare system that was corrupt and it was, it was not good for our community. Seeing how outside entities were taking advantage and exploiting our people in our communities, I knew that the system had to change. I didn't know the right words to call them at such a young age, but I knew that I wanted to move to DC because that was where the heart of policy and change happens. And I knew I wanted to go there and be an advocate. I wanted to at first be in Indian Health Service because the system was so corrupt and so wrong at such an early age of seeing family members suffer from this system. I wanted to go to the Indian Health Service and be the IHS director and someone that I looked up to currently at the time, Dr. Yvette Rubido, who was from Rosebud, some, another tribe in my state. And I was like, that's who I want to be. But when I finally had the opportunity of moving to DC after spending a couple years staying in Maine after I had graduated, not only to train and work with my coach out of Boston for New Balance, but I also wanted to just work locally with Penobscot Indian Nation and a, um, another native nonprofit focused on business and economic development in the five tribes in the state of Maine. I finally had the courage to, to pack up everything, leave everything that I knew to move to DC. When I got there, it wasn't what I expected. I think I had this naive notion of what DC is supposed to be and how it's creating change. Well, yes, it is doing that. It's very slow moving. I started working for a health organization um, for Indian Country, and we were out on the hill lobbying for programs like the Special Diabetes Programs for Indians, um, as well as contract support costs and other initiatives. And I started seeing when we were on the hill Congressional members didn't really care to hear about what's going on in Indian country. And when I saw bills being proposed, legislation, it seemed that you know, what was being proposed originally was being changed. It was being updated. It was a give and take to who you wanted um, or who, what you wanted included in that legislation. It never was its an in intention, intense, intentional purpose of what it's supposed to be to protect and uplift people. It was always, what are you going to do for me so I can sign your bill? And I didn't like that system. And so that motivated me to want to work back into our local communities. So I left the Hill, um, especially after working four months for Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of the state of Maine. I realized that that wasn't for me. And I could have, hopefully, a better impact and change and influence change by working directly with our communities. So I started working for the Administration for Native Americans, where we were helping tribes implement their projects and grants and really watching their progress and really watching them lead these projects to reclaim their language, to um, create businesses, to you know, put immersion schools into their communities so that our little ones can start learning their language at a young age so that we can increase the fluency so that part of our cultural identity carries on into the future. And it was really amazing to be part of that process. And then in the midst of that, I began going to rallies. My first rally that I ever went to was to protest the Keystone XL pipeline, which were coming through my homelands. I saw the organizers there of like Indigenous Environmental Network reject and protect the Cowboy Indian Alliance. 
And I was really inspired by the work that they were doing. And a lot of the people that were organizing there lived in DC. So I had people to look up to and people that I wanted to support in their organizing efforts. And I realized, you know, I'd rather support them than be the organizer because it looked exhausting and stressful. <laughs> and it always seemed like they were burning both candles at, at both ends, but it seemed worth it. Um, but that changed for me in 2016 when I was asked to organize some sort of event to welcome the Standing Rock youth who ran over 2,000 miles from Cannonball, North Dakota to Washington, D.C. to hand deliver a petition to President Barack Obama um, to oppose the, the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I thought, if our youth, our younger generations, are this passionate about something and are willing to put their bodies under that kind of stress to fight for, for our life, for our water, for our future, I can get behind that. And that inspired me to do this event for them. Granted, at the end of the day, after we ran from the Supreme Court to Army Corps of Engineers, we had a protest there trying to have discussions with people going in and out of the building, scheduled personal meetings with just the youth and White House staff to try and talk about this issue because there was lack of travel consultation in this process. And it was violating treaty rights. It was violating human rights. And at the end of the day, I went home and said, I'm never doing that again. Having to go through the permit process and making sure everyone's safety was there and providing food and water, that's just something I was like, I'm going to let the others do it, and I'll just continue supporting. But then a few weeks later, the dog attacks happened in Standing Rock. And we all saw what happened on Facebook Live and on Democracy Now! and was hearing about these injustices happening. And I was like, I got to do something. I can't blog about it. I can't just post a picture about it. I can't just retweet or reshare. Something has to be done because this is, this is injustice and this isn't fair. So then I started showing up at the White House with a sign. Like it started out. It started out as just me, and then I started meeting more indigenous organizers in the community on Piscataway lands, which is the lands that are Washington, D.C., and we started a collective, and we started organizing, and then I started asserting myself into conversations and other, organizer, other organizers' platforms because they were organizing on behalf of indigenous people, but not necessarily including us in that process, not inviting us to stand on that stage or sit on that panel and hear from us. And it wasn't fair seeing their voices speak for us. And so I became that probably annoying one for a while, just like, hey, who are you? Why aren't you inviting us? We have a local Piscataway native to do land acknowledgment which is important, and it's a great first step into correcting the narrative while honoring and respecting indigenous people. And if you don't know what land acknowledgment is, it's what I did by honoring the Ottawa, Chippewa, and Potawatomi people. And for indigenous people, it's a growing movement. It's being seen in our geotags. It's being seen at the bottom of a post on Instagram, because we want to acknowledge and, and respect those people, our people. But for non-Indigenous people, it's so great to see that it's growing. It's on curriculum, syllabi, um, institutions like UCLA and Cal State, like they, they implemented it in their entire UC system. But that's not enough. We need to be proactive and start implementing and taking it a step further past land acknowledgement by putting it into our education because Indigenous history is past and present. And we need to start making sure that we're correcting that narrative and making sure indigenous people are included in every single day. Um, and then inviting indigenous people into those spaces to be the ones, to be the voices that you're centering to help make that change. So if you're leaving here today and you are inspired by land acknowledgments and that's something you want to do too, do the land acknowledgment, do your research, Google go to a library, go to a cultural center if it's there, do your due diligence and, and educate yourself on the lands that you reside on. Um, or the lands that you're visiting. Let's say you're going to visit, I don't know, um, Yosemite National Park. That's you know indigenous to the Miwok people. Awani is, is what the Yosemite Valley is called. Um, and by, by recognizing those indigenous place names, you're honoring that history and you're honoring the people of it today. And you're not erasing who they are because we still exist, we're still here. Um, but yeah, going back uh, to DC, that's something that we started doing collectively together is making sure these land acknowledgements were happening, making sure that we were invited into these spaces so that we could start talking because 
after after No Dapple Standing Rock, it I think it was like an awakening or something, like, oh my gosh, Native people are here and everyone around the world is coming in to support, which was great. It brought in allies. But I think it just showed the stronger message that we have always been here and we don't belong in textbooks and the textbooks aren't even accurate. So moving forward, we just started organizing and then I founded Rising Hearts, which is an indigenous-led organizing group, basically to do everything possible. Either it's connecting um, an ally to an indigenous person of wherever they're organizing, making sure that the, the right people are involved. Um, we helped organize part of the indigenous women's block and the women's march. We did helped, we helped organize the Occupy inauguration with Indigenous Environmental Network. We did March for Racial Justice. We did the Go Red Hawks campaign where we created a parody to show the world what it would be like to not have a racist Washington football team name. Um, and we dominated the, the media and internet by painting that vision. Um, as well as we, we got 200,000 people to come to DC for the People's Climate March to, to protect our climate, to protect Unchi Maka, our grandmother earth, um, and really create a better future moving forward. And so we were really involved with kind of just doing everything that we could um, to increase indigenous presence and increase indigenous visibility. And from there, I, I started learning more about MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And right at the time when I decided this is something I want to learn more about and start organizing on, um, the death of Savannah LaFontaine Greywind made national news. And that was kind of the turning point for me of making sure that I, among many, are speaking out about this injustice, this long-standing historical violence that's been happening to indige indigenous women, but indigenous people since colonization. Um, my, my first organized event that I did for MMIW was doing a prayer vigil for her. Um, and we got everyone that we could in DC to come and do a prayer circle. Um, we had some land, we had land acknowledgement, we had drums, we had music, we had food, and we tried to find ways to support this, this injustice, to support the family, but also to support the much larger movement. And it was very emotional, and I didn't know what to think of it moving forward, but I just felt really passionate about, you know, trying to speak on this. And so I, I did some more research and found out, you know, MMIW, this movement, really originated um, from our First Nations relatives in Canada. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard about the injustices happening there, but they have a whole highway called the Highway of Tears with all of these indigenous people going missing and found murdered on this highway. And they have women whose unsolved cases go back to the 60s and 70s, and it's just heartbreaking. And connecting it to the times that I was little, to when I was 18 years old going into my freshman year of college, recognizing some of the funerals that I've been to and asking the questions now that I've been older, what was, why did she die? Why was she taken from us? And learning that it was from violence, domestic violence, murder. Um, I realized that this is prevalent and this has been ongoing. And so moving forward, I moved to, to LA and, a couple years ago and I started organizing with Me Too. And when I've been invited to speak on panels and to try and talk about MMIW, I really like to make the connection You know that this has been happening since colonization, since 1492. We've had to face genocide and all of this violence and systematic oppression, but also this happened to who you know as Pocahontas. Her name is Matoaka, but she is the first MMIW. And that's something that I like to try and speak to and recognize because what everyone else sees is a Disney movie that hypersexualizes Pocahontas because that's what they think natives looked like and then you see it in costume stores for Halloween and cultural appropriation of people dressing as our culture. 
that's disrespectful and I advise you to not do it. And if you notice other people doing it, try to educate them about cultural appropriation and try and tell them the story of what these Pocahontas costumes actually really mean, the actual story. And that's Matoaka. And moving forward, I, I started organizing these events to try and just talk about MMIW. Organizing with the local community of indigenous women, trying to uplift this movement, and trying to get allies to understand that this is something that they can be part of and help uplift and help us. Potentially even help carry some of the emotional burden that this is, because this is heartbreaking, this is triggering, this is traumatizing. And sometimes we just need someone else to like help carry us because what we're doing is very heavy and it's hard to speak about day in and day out. And I thought there would come a time when speaking about MMIW and our missing and our murdered, it would get easier, but I still get choked up just trying to talk about them. But this past year, I wanted to do something more. I wasn't a lawyer, so I couldn't try and help solve cases. I wasn't you know, a cartographist who can help pull the data, like Anita Lucchesi of Sovereign Bodies Institute, who's creating the first ever database um, of MMIW. And I was a runner. That's all I've known my whole life. I'm a, I come, I'm a fourth generation runner. Um, my, my mother and my grandfather were training for the Olympics in their times, but due to life situations, they were unable to go. So it's kind of been my pipe dream to get to the Olympic trials, and right now I only see that as doing that in the marathon, so that's my goal right now. Um, but I started connecting advocacy with running, and I had joined in running prayer vigils or running to raise awareness, but I never connected it to a competitive platform, because I always thought as just being a runner, I'm trying to run fast, I'm just going to focus on race. So March of last year of 2018, I dedicated my bib number to MMIW instead of having my name on it at the San Diego Half Marathon, hoping that it could spark conversations and dialogue once I crossed the finish line to hopefully influence change um, and build allies. And it did. I got to talk to a couple people, but it wasn't enough. I, for the rest of that year, I continued organizing, continued blogging, and just continued working. Um, still unsure of how to uplift this movement higher so that it gets the attention that it deserves. Then March 28, 2019 came and I did the same thing. I dedicated my bib number to MMIWG, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Still talked to a couple people after I crossed the finish line, um, but it wasn't enough. And a month later I had the opportunity to run the 2019 Boston Marathon. And Boston is one of my favorite places. I, I love going back, um, just coming from the New England region. So I was really excited, really excited to be on the course rather than cheering. Um, but I was also a chaperone for Wings of America. Um, we were bringing five Native youth who were juniors to Boston to run in the 5K. And then we were also there to support them in their college visit with Harvard um, to hopefully inspire them that this is or to let them know that this is an option for you, that don't hold yourself back. You can apply to any institution you want. Um, and that was amazing in and of itself. Seeing our youth talk about the things that they knew were wrong and corrupt in this, in this oppressive system, and also knowing that every single job that they said they wanted were all going back to helping their people, and they knew how to get there. So it was really inspiring to see that this generation knows what they want, and they want to make change. I called my mom and dad and I told them, can you find me red face paint? I didn't tell them what I was gonna do and I wasn't sure I was gonna tell anybody about what I was gonna do. But I decided to paint this movement on my body, hoping that it could honor them, I can give respect to them and let them know that they're not forgotten. On our way to the starting line, my partner was driving and I started painting MMIW onto my legs and my arm. Then when we got to Hopkinton to get on the buses to go to the start line, he helped me put the red handprint on my face. And the red symbolizes our earth, but also symbolizes this movement. 
and the handprint symbolizes the violence that's silencing our women and our people. I had no idea going into it the impact that this would have, the ripple effect that it would create. I honestly had the same notion people are not going to care about this, or if I post a photo talking about this, probably only in our, my indigenous circles were going to see this image, and it wouldn't expand beyond that. The gun goes off, and I say my first name. I say a prayer, and then I finish out the rest of the mile, trying to be present, trying to enjoy the Boston Marathon, trying to just have fun. I had 25 names to go. I get to the halfway point, and I see my partner just happy and cheering for me. I'm so excited, I just stop and give him a hug. I give him a kiss. He makes sure I hydrate, and then I ask him, Oh, and then I tell him and as I'm running, and he's running along with me, um, I was like, I just saw a Hopi relative and a Dene relative like on the course. So there was definitely indigenous presence on that course that day, which was awesome to see and feel and be around. Um, but moving forward, running forward, I asked him, I was like, where's mom? Because my mom gets anxiety. And he's like, she's right up ahead. You'll see her. I come up the hill a little bit, and I see her like, in the distance, but like so many people are trying to get in front of her. And then I lose sight of her again. And then I'm like looking around panicking, and then she leelies to me. And then I hear it, and I knew where to look. And then I started leelying back, and then I just kept going. But seeing her there and, and having like us connect in that way was just inspiring, and it just kept me going. Towards the end of the, the marathon, in the last mile, I see my mom and my partner again at mile 25. And that's when I knew to just kick it in hard and just finish strong. And I get through that prayer, and I come into the last point two, into the finish. And I'm hurting because I'm just trying to honor them the best way I can in, in the best place that I know how, um, and that's by running. I come through the finish, and the last point two is dedicated to my grandfather, who was a runner who had passed away from cancer. And he was my biggest inspiration. And the last thing he knew that I was doing was organizing that event to welcome our Native youth into DC. And before he was incoherent and unable to talk, he, the last things he told me was, good job, kid. And he was very passionate about our Native youth, especially our Native youth athletes. So me organizing after he passed away in the dog attacks. He was part of that inspiration to keep going and organizing. And I felt that this was my purpose and this is a way to grieve, to heal, and to also hopefully honor my grandfather. So in that last point too was for him. Come through to the finish and I see Patty Dillon, who was the first native woman to be signed by Nike the first Native woman to run a two-hour and 30-minute marathon and had the world record, and she was Mi'kmaq. And I finished, I told her my story, and I told her what the prayers were, who were they for, and she just gave me a hug, and we just started crying. But in that moment, it was so wonderful to be embraced by another Native woman who gets it, who knew why I was running for the reasons I was. Then I posted the photo. I posted the photo that you see on the program, and that just shows the power of hashtag. It shows the power of the red handprint, the image. And I also included every single name. And two of them are missing. And a few days after, um, two of them were actually found safe. So that was good. I, I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but I was just happy to know that they were found and they were two little girls. And for the first time in my life, as I was reflecting on it after that, you know, this was the most meaningful run of my life where I, it made sense. I felt like I had a new purpose. Running for, for them, running for our indigenous relatives who are no longer here from us and have been taken from us and stolen, this meant everything to me, and I hope that it meant something to them. Moving forward, I didn't know what this would look like, but I knew running for them in every race that I can and dedicating it to them to uplift them in this movement to hopefully find solutions to end this historical violence and oppression, you know, will honor them and 
create a safer future for our women and for our, our, our young ones. And then we had these amazing opportunities. We were in Sports Illustrated. We were in Runner's World. We were in Now This. We were in so many platforms. Then a week later after I finished, a girl, Rosalie Fish, reached out to me on Instagram and said, I want to do the same thing. How do I do this? And can I have your blessing to do the same thing at my state meet? We were talking for that whole month and going into her state meet, she did the same thing, had the red handprint, MMIW, and it went viral. And then more women from Running For Our Lives out in Rapid City who ran the marathon, they all did the same thing. And then more athletes are doing this. A high school in Montana, boys cross country team just did the same thing. Um, a girls cross country team, Mapia Luta, they did the same thing. And then Rosalie just did it at her um, cross country nationals meet and it's, she's in her first year of college. Um, so it's spreading and it's showing that advocacy doesn't have to be on a stage or at a march or a protest or a panel, it can be on any platform that you create, and when you combine what you're passionate about in life with a passion worth fighting for, like you have a platform that you can create and lead forward, and you're gonna inspire people. I honestly thought this wouldn't lead to what it has, but it did, and when I saw that it made an impact on Rosalie, and then Rosalie's impact, and then other runners who have been doing this, it's just, coming full circle and inspiring me continuously to keep going, it empowers me to keep going. And now I've done four races where I've dedicated to our missing and murdered. And I'm making sure that as I'm going, I'm trying to be educational with this new platform that I'm creating as I go. I try to make sure that I list off all of their names. I'll dedicate a picture with a story about them on my social media. I'll, um, I'll have photos and links going to organizations and people that you can be donating to and supporting and uplifting, um, as well as you know trying to be inclusive of all our people, our men, our elders, our babies, our two-spirit people, LGBTQ, and making sure that they're part of these dedications as well, because it's not just our women, it's predominantly our women, but it's expanded so much more beyond that. And so, I'm at this point in my life where I am trying to heal. I think I went na pretty naive with thinking I'm gonna be okay running because running has always been my outlet, my safety, my way of healing and disconnecting. But now that I am running for them, it's been a really heavy emotional burden. It's been heartbreaking. It's My mind's constantly filled with their stories, not just who they were, but what happened to them. And it's, it gave me almost, yeah, well it did. I had an emotional breakdown in July after my third race. And it was to the point that I just was so depressed and so sad and I could only go to work and I could only run. And running was the only way that could get me outside and to feel good. But other than that, I couldn't associate with people because I was hurting so bad and carrying all of this. Now that I'm healing and learning how to move forward in a good way to uplift this message and this movement, but trying to find ways to protect my mental and physical health, it's a learning process. And I wanna make sure that I'm not rushing it and I'm doing it in the right way so that I can continue running for our missing and murdered. Um, because I plan on doing this until I don't have to anymore and I may be doing this until the day I go. But I'm, I'm hoping that this you know, is just the catalyst that spreads because more people are talking about it. And I'm starting to see this be on so many other different platforms and so many stories are starting to be told about this and other Native people are starting to be uplifted and centered who are doing the work and who have been doing this work for decades because this has been such an ongoing issue. Um, but yeah, running for justice is what I, I'm calling it, is just my new purpose with running. Uh, my way to heal, my way to give back, my way to honor and pay respect, and my way to hopefully educate every you know, person that's non-indigenous, because we know what this is, we know what this means in our communities. And I'm hoping that it just leads to a time where 
we don't have to ask the question, am I next? Like, I don't want to look over and see like my friends or family and just wonder like, are they going to be taken from us? Are they going to go missing? Are they going to be on a missing flyer? And since this is something that I'm dedicating my life to, I feel like I'm seeing it so much more. I'm seeing so many more missing flyers being shared on my Facebook, or I'm being tagged, or I'm being emailed, all of these things. And I don't know if it's just always been that way, or now that I'm, I'm dedicating this, this is kind of opening it up for me to see more of it. But this, it, this is an issue that has to end. This is so many years of hurting, and those families need healing and justice. They don't deserve to be going through this turmoil anymore and this heartache. And so I'm just hoping I can create a better world where we don't have to wonder and worry if we're going to be next or if your daughter is going to be next or if I have kids, if she's going to be next. Because it's, it's, a, it's a terrifying thought. And it's now that I've dedicated my life to this, I am a little, I'm more scared now. I'm, my partner's scared. He's, he never knew about this issue and he, always says like whenever we're at a gas station or big crowded places and I'm gone a little too long, he worries. Now that he knows that you know human trafficking is huge in Indian country and we're targeted, um, that's just a worry. And now that I'm kind of putting myself out there and creating this platform and exposing myself, I'm probably potentially opening myself to this kind of danger. Um, but it's something that I think about a lot. And talking about the violence on our women, you know, it's connected to what's happening to the violence against our earth, to Untri Maka. The repeated violence that's happening with the fossil fuel industry, extractive methods, you know, that's that filters into the, the violence happening on our people. And I don't know if you're aware, but man camps that are along these pipelines, especially up in um, Canada, Alberta, the Bakken oil fields down into the Dakotas with the um, with Dapple coming in, and then you have Key Excel, you have Line 3, you have Kinder Morgan, you have all of these places, the Potomac pipeline. Those are going to bring man camps in. And man camps are prevalent in violence that are on our indigenous women in our communities. And those man camps that house these workers are placed against, are near border towns. Um, and reservations are near those border towns. And so you have human trafficking that's happening. You have our, our youth, our little ones, our women, our boys being trafficked into these for prostitution and, and other atrocities that's happening. But you have strong sexual assault and domestic violence happening on our, on our people. Um, and so I think when we can start correcting and living in a good way with our earth and start treating her right and respecting her and finding clean, renewable solutions in creating a healthier environment, we're going to start seeing the violence on our people coming to an end. And that's just one way that we can combat you know, this violence. Um, but yeah, just this is my story and this is what I'm doing. Um, for how you can help for allies out there. If you have connections and you have the means to help, help center indigenous voices, help center indigenous people of color organizers on these platforms. Because these injustices are happening everywhere across the country. And they're happening to marginalized communities and they're mostly happening to people of color. So if you, have, if you know people that can help, make those connections. And one thing that I'm starting to see now that I'm living in LA is obviously being in the film industry, living there, you know, asking yourself if you're the right person to be telling this story. And that's something that we've seen, you know, with pipelines and, you know, exclusivity. Like, indigenous people aren't being invited to these platforms. They're not in invited to have a seat at the table to talk about these issues that are happening. DAPL potentially could have not have happened if they were invited into the tribal consultation process accurately. Then we might not have this, the atrocities that happened and the violence that happened on our frontline, on our frontline protectors. But 
asking yourself if you're the right person to help uplift is where you can start. And one thing that I'm trying to also move into, aside from running for justice, but I'm also trying to get into the film industry because I'm starting to see the lack of representation, and that's what we need. We need representation and we need visibility. And we're starting to see that improve. We're starting to see more of us out there on these platforms and speaking and you know, leading these roles. But we need more of it because we're trying to correct the narrative and we're always, I feel like we're kind of on the defense of you know, advocating for ourselves all the time and inserting ourselves into these places so that we can speak, so that we can correct the narrative. And so I'm trying to move into the film industry to help uplift that and starting Intro Tribal, which will be something that kind of what I've already been doing is making sure people are being connected to the right people, being that facilitator, making sure that people are being included in the conversations, making sure that there's cultural respect and representation there, um, and also making a film, Running for Justice. Basically, this idea that I had you know, after Boston, you know, I want to help tell this story. I want to be the vessel running to help uplift this message, but I want to provide and create this film, this platform for the families and the people leading these efforts to talk about what's going on, to talk about how we can help support and uplift. And so hopefully that'll be taking place next year. Um, the one idea is to highlight uh, the, the Highway of Tears, where I hopefully will try and plan to run from one end of the highway to the other, um, which is like 430 miles. Um, and visiting with the communities of First Nations all along the way um, and interviewing them and hopefully doing some community organizing to help support them. Um, but if that idea doesn't get greenlit, the other idea is to be in Alberta, North Dakota, and South Dakota to highlight the man camps and the violence that's happening on our earth and our indigenous women will be the other option. Um, but yeah, this is my story and I appreciate you guys being here and for listening to me, and I hope that it was educational, but thank you. Thank you, Jordan Marie. And at this time, we will entertain any questions from the audience. Jordan Marie, I am a Chippewa elder on this land, and we welcome you. Oh, I wish you did the land acknowledgement. <laughs> I wanted to add something to the dialogue that I think might be a good potential second step after land acknowledgement. I don't know that, of course, that it could work in every circumstance, but I'm wondering if you would think about and perhaps consider and perhaps integrate um, in public forums where we know well, given that we were in the last U.S. Census, we're, we're roughly at about 1.5% of the general population. Um, I just want to pause on that for a moment and think about that number. Um, maybe one of the lovely things for the land itself would be for us to have an opportunity to be welcomed by the speaker right after the land acknowledgement. So that not only does that happen, but um, those around who may not be indigenous would have a face to put to the land um, because you're so diligent in your respect for, for us because you are us. I simply wanted to throw that out in case that would be something you might consider bringing into the discussion um, would be just that so that there really is a quick sense of community building that could happen because I, um, I guess I'll just wrap that up with, I just really appreciate that you came today and um, everything that you shared and Muffy Philippa and some other things, they were just here a month ago. So anyways, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, especially in community organizing, I always make sure like, I always try not to give the land acknowledgement. 
I try to make sure that people that are indigenous to those lands are the ones that do it. And if I or some other native has to, that's always the last kind of option. But yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying that's part of, you know, intro tribal. I help, you know, people send in requests to me all the time, like who can do an a land acknowledgement, and like it's always me connecting them with actual people indigenous to those lands. Thank you. Yes. Ooh, I have lots of questions, but I'll <laughs> uh, not ask them all because. There's probably other people here. Uh, my name is Angie. I am a first year PhD student in health and medical geography at Michigan State University. Um, <clears throat> and uh, miigwech for coming here. Um, we're glad that you're here and also for that land acknowledgement. We just started doing that at Michigan State too. Awesome. And just a quick commentary for everybody else on those. Like she said, you can reach out. Sometimes the schools have them. Sometimes there's an indigenous studies program within the schools that have them, tribes have them. There's lots of resources you can get for doing these land acknowledgements. And so um, it's pretty exciting that, um, that this is what's happening now. Um, I have our land acknowledgement as a tagline in my emails, and I sent an email to somebody in the agriculture department the other day, and he emailed back, was like, I had no idea that we were sitting on Ojibwe land. He's like, I, I just happened to see that in your tagline. And he's yeah. like, that's, that's really awesome. He's like, I'm, I had no idea. But um, anyway, what I wanted to say was that um, one of the parts that you were talking about that really um, struck a chord with me is <clears throat> the part about your healing. Um, I, um, so as I mentioned, I'm first year PhD student. And what I'm studying um, is access to um, breastfeeding support services in tribal communities. Um, I was a, my, I have a two and a half year old who I breastfed, um, and when I made the decision to breastfeed, I didn't, I had no role models, because I wasn't breastfed, none of my siblings were breastfed, my mom didn't breastfeed, none of her siblings were breastfed, so we didn't really, you know, we just knew it, didn't know anything about it, but I knew it was best for my baby. Um, Anyway, it was a difficult journey and it was just, you know, whatever. So that's kind of what got me here, why I'm here at Michigan State. Well, you know, much like you, I, well, I was born, you know, near the res. I lived there my whole entire life. Then I went to college and I stepped out in this other world. So I knew all these atrocities were happening to us. I just never really had time to process them before. And now that I'm here and I'm doing this research and I'm studying how colonization has affected everything about our lives. Like, I knew this happened, you know what I mean? I've known, since I was a child, these things about Columbus, and I knew that they tried to kill us, and I knew that they did all these things. I never had time to process them. Yeah. Right now, I'm processing them, and that's what's, like, killing me. So, same thing. I, it, it's hard. It, this is heavy stuff. There are things that I knew about before. I just didn't have time to, like, grieve for it, so I'm, like, learning about how one of the ways they tried to kill us was by taking us from our moms and didn't allow us to breastfeed. So then yeah. we also didn't learn how to do it, right? So I just wanted to say that this is all to say that um, it's, it's going to be rough. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, now you're getting to, it, it's all things you knew, you just didn't really have time to like feel them or grieve for them or like acknowledge how truly messed up these things are that are going on. And now yeah. we have time, now we're doing that. And so it's hard. And yeah. so I'm with you. I will pray <laughs> for you because it, it is rough. But thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. And I think it speaks to us not being connected to, like we know it's there. We know that generational trauma is there. We know our, our elder stories. We know the, the stories within our communities. But I think it takes certain triggers and certain life situations to to be connected and to see that and for me that's that's what happened with running for MMIW is now I'm like fully exposed to it and I'm I feel incredibly vulnerable and incredibly like you know almost wanting to cry all, all, all the time <laughs> um, but yeah it's part of my healing um, healing journey and trying to find more ways to connect back 
with who I am as a Lakota woman and as an indigenous person connecting back to cultural, traditional foodways um, that I'm learning about now, um, as well as learning to how to bead. Takes time, gets my focus in there, helps with my anxiety because I've never dealt with anxiety before in my life until this all happened and that's what kind of led into this kind of emotional breakdown was I was having anxiety attacks and I had no idea what was happening to me and why I was just so frazzled and crying all the time and feeling sad when it, I felt like it wasn't helping the, the reasons why I was doing this. But yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> We have another question. Buju, Sage Namebin in Nijnakash, Makun Nindagu Ojibwemo. Hi, um, Chime Gwen for being here. We really appreciate you having you. Thank so you. I really, really loved you talking about creating your own narrative and empowerment and a thing you love, such as running and talking about how advocacy doesn't need to be on a stage. Can you discuss with us a little bit about how you think creating our own platforms and taking back our narrative is gonna intersect with academia and some of those barriers that we're gonna have as indigenous people in this country? Yeah, I think just combining that in academia, like whether you're learning to become a teacher and going through that system or working with professors and institutions to assert yourself into that and be like, one, do land acknowledgments, that's a small step. Start incorporating this into your curriculum and your syllabi and start talking about this. Start involving indigenous teachers. We're, we're teachers, we're lawyers, we're volunteers, we're activists, we're runners, we're so many things. Um, we're more than the stereotypes that exist um, that so colonized society has dictated us to be. Um, but I think just finding what you're passionate about, and if that's academia, you know, go right for it. Start having conversations and meetings with department heads in the institution, and just start being present there and, and being a constant voice. Because for me, like I said, with, with community activism, it was just me standing in front of the White House. And then all of a sudden, now I was on the National Local Steering Committee five months later planning the People's Climate March where we got over 200,000 people to come. And so it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can have an impact, large or small, on whatever platform that you are passionate about and that you want to create. And I think you know, changing how we look at things of how change has to, to be meaningful or to be seen um, I think is just being creative and innovative by creating new platforms because clearly, you know, rallies and marches are great, but I, sometimes they just don't serve their purpose and it's not making the impact that it needs. So I just say start talking to, to people in your school, into institutions, into the department heads and just having these conversations, seeing if they're open to like including new information into their syllabi and start talking about it and involving indigenous speakers and teachers and having you be part of that process to make sure that it's done in the right way. Thank you. We'll have one more question. So I'm trying to shed my ignorance as a 24-year-old privileged white person. And I have the opportunity to um, teach and um, talk to a classroom full of a majority of white children who read these false narratives and really know only about um, Native peoples through cartoons like Pocahontas. And I, I don't know where to start with them to try and reverse that. How old are they? Um, they're in third grade. Um, I mean, instead of Pocahontas, have them watch Molly of Denali, which is like the first time where actual indigenous representation is involved in creating this story that is focused on an actual indigenous person, starting there. Um, I guess just doing research and finding indigenous teachers that may have already created curriculum or reaching out um, to, I guess, like college institutions to their um, Native American studies departments or teachers to see if they have any kind of curriculum that's, you know, age appropriate, but, you know, able to start correcting the narrative at that age of how they see Native people. 
But Molly and Janali is great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. And at this time, we would like to share um, a token of appreciation um, with Jordan, Marie, and uh, Jennifer Smith will present. Hi. It's just a sweatshirt to keep warm <laughs> on the way back. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I was so happy to come here to cold weather from LA. I was so happy to see snow. <laughs> That I was missed. not the response we expected from her, by the way. <laughs> I was already like had my North Face jacket and my snow boots, and I was like, yes. You're lucky we just got it. I know. <laughs> so if we can so give happy. Jordan Marie one more round of applause. And thank you. Thank you all for being here as well. And Lila Wopi Latanka for being here. Thank you very much.